How you doing this weekend? It is great to see you as we continue our series, Basics, and we're talking about kind of the foundational things we need to be able to grow in our relationship with Jesus. Week one, Steve talked about loving God, which is incredibly foundational of anything. Week two, we talked about loving people made in the image and likeness of God. And then last week, I talked with you about big church. Why do we gather together on the weekends? Why do we come together in community like this? And we talked about what is the purpose of the church, both big church and small church. Why do we do it? And we talked about the fact that you and I are the church and we need to invest in what we are. And this weekend, we're talking about small church specifically. What does that look like for you and me? And we used that passage out of the book of Acts last week to set the stage that they met in the temple courts, but they also met home to home. They did life and community together. I want to start by asking you a question this weekend, and that is this. Do you want to experience all that God has made you for? Do you want to walk in the purpose and fulfill the plan he has for your life? And I know it's somewhat of a rhetorical question because I've yet to ever meet somebody that says, no, I would like to live purposeless. No, I would like to not fulfill anything that I was made for and just meander through life in the midst of nothingness. The truth is that each of us is made for a purpose. Each of us has value and worth before God. And I could argue from scriptures, we talk about small church this weekend, that to truly find your purpose, to truly fulfill what you were made for, you need to be connected in small community. You need to be connected in small community. Now, some of you guys go, whoa, hold on, Jason. You had me until you started talking about other people. I don't want to be around other people. I've had experiences that have not been great. I've had people that have betrayed me, people that maybe hurt me. I was maybe involved in a church and it didn't go the way I wanted. And you're telling me I need to be connected in community? That that, that I got to get around these people again? It's just really not my thing. If you only knew what I had experienced, Jason, if you really understood. And whether you're someone who comes from a non-believing background and you've just kind of seen it from the outside or someone who has kind of been de-churched, you were in church, involved and connected in community, and now you're like, "Ah, I don't know if I can do it. I want to start by first saying, if you had a bad experience, I'm sorry, because that's not the way that God intended it to be. That wasn't God's desire. It wasn't God's plan or his purpose for you to experience that. But as the age old adage goes, we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater because here's the truth. God's plan A, his first plan, his priority was for you and me to be in community. He never intended the gospel, the good news of Jesus to be a solo act. He intended it to be something that we do together as we live for the purpose and for the kingdom of God. Hebrews 10, 25 puts it this way. We talked about it last week. Not neglecting or deserting or forsaking to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day draw near. The return of Jesus. We were made for community. And one thing I want to encourage and challenge you with is simply this. You can't have the reward and the benefit of relationship and community without the possibility of risk or hurt. But here's the good news. I believe that the risk is far outweighed by the benefit we have in Jesus. It'll be work. You're going to have to work through things, talk through things, fix things, adjust things. But here's the truth. The good news is it's worth it. The good news is it's worth it. We say it all the time. If you want to go fast, go ahead and go alone. But if you want to go far, if you want to experience meaning in life, go together. So how do we define small church here at CTC? Small church is any small gathering of Jesus followers, and it can be those that are seeking or wanting to become that choose to meet together regularly with the purpose of becoming more like the one they're following, Jesus. In our church context, that could be a traditional life group or small group where you get together and you go through a series, like many people have begun our series, Thriving in Babylon, this last week. And you're doing a study and you're breaking down scripture together. You're talking about life and how you interact with this. You're eating some food together and you're getting to know each other and share life. 
For you, it could be an activity group where maybe you're playing bocce ball together or you're going out golfing or whatever it may be and you're spending time together. It could be softball. And as you get to know each other, you're doing life and you're talking about challenges. You're praying for each other. You're encouraging each other in your journey with Jesus. It could be a serving group where maybe you're helping with Street to Seed or your Hope to Home or you're helping uh, you know, with our children's ministry or youth ministry and you're connecting with these other leaders. You're rubbing shoulders and you're encouraging each other in the journey. Or maybe for you, it's a support group where there's some habits and hangups and you, you need to go beyond that and you're involved in Celebrate Recovery or Cleansing Stream and, and you're beginning to grow in the journey with other people of like faith. I know for my wife and I, this has been invaluable. You know, I, I lead different groups and I'm connected in small group contexts, but w- my wife, Heather, and I, we go and attend a young marriage group every other Wednesday and we just have this great time together with these other couples. We talk about life, we eat good food, we celebrate, we share hurts, and we walk through things together. And it has made all the difference. I'll give you an example. This last year has been hard when my father-in-law passed away from a sudden heart attack In January, my mother-in-law was in a coma at the time. Thank God she's recovered from that. Our small group was some of our biggest support. They walked us through the journey. It was not easy, but with their support, it made it possible. So in your experience, good or bad, my guess is that there were some things that were either present or not present. For some of you, when you had this good experience, you're like, man, it was just awesome and I enjoyed community and I can't quite put my finger on what made it so good. And for others, you had a bad experience. You're like, I know something was missing. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but it wasn't a great experience. And as a result of that, sometimes it's a little bit vague. And so as a church family here at CTC, we have come up with these six we call win statements They're kind of this ability for us to diagnose different small group contexts and say, is this a win? Is this doing what the Bible says it should or not? And so as I share with you, we believe last week we talked about the value of small groups. This week we're talking about what should small groups really be doing? What should it look like so we can be in healthy, Christ-honoring community? We're going to use kind of a little fun little fun a diagnostic here as we go through and talk about these six different elements that are absolutely key to you and I being effective. We're going to use an acrostic of a grasp. So A space G-R-A-S-P. And here's the truth. I believe as we go through these, some of you are going to go, wow, that was in the small group I was in, and that's why it was so good. Or, you know, that wasn't, or this could have been. And my hope is that it will help to show you why some of our experiences maybe are the way they are. And our desire as we teach and train leaders is that these things are always present in small group community because we believe when they are, it's going to be healthy, it's going to represent Jesus, and it's going to be life-changing. And the encouragement I have for you as we dive into these is that if you signed up to be a part of one of the small groups that we help orchestrate, that we're actively, aggressively trying to make sure that these principles are always present within our groups. So if you have your Bibles, you turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, because I believe the Bible is going to help to flush out these principles for us this weekend. As you turn there, I want to ask you a question. Who was the greatest small group leader ever? I'll give you a hint. It wasn't Judas. This would be a great time to insert your typical Sunday school answer. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. Think about what Jesus did. Jesus took a ragtag group of 12 disciple rejects, essentially, guys who weren't selected by the Pharisees, they weren't selected by the Sadducees, they weren't selected by the local rabbis or any of the religious institutions, and he used them to change the world. He selected ordinary people and some not-so-ordinary people, Men and women from different backgrounds, men that were fishermen, tax collectors, Jewish zealots, which were essentially terrorists to the Roman government, tradesmen from various crafts. Women were also a heavy part of his ministry, including Martha of Bethany and Mary of Magdalene, one of which was formerly a demonized individual. Jesus got them together and used them to forever change the world. We see that Jesus understood that disciples aren't truly made in a classroom, though classrooms can be made are part of discipleship. He knew they had to do life together. They had to spend time together. They had to eat together, and they had to, to go on journeys together and travel together, and they had to do the journey 
together to really experience life. And as they did, the disciples understood something important, and that's the mentality of Jesus. Philippians 2, 1 through 8 puts it this way, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mine. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus clearly understood and demonstrated to you and I what real community should look like. Jesus walked in humility, he walked in love, he walked in grace, he walked in encouragement, he challenged, he, he helped lead people into truth. And the disciples clearly understood this and they grabbed onto this. And everything we talk about with these principles this weekend is simply wrapped around this truth. The attitude of Jesus makes all the difference. The attitude of Jesus makes the difference for you and me. As we go into community, if we come with the attitude of Jesus, anything we are able to overcome, anything we're able to walk through, no matter how difficult, no matter how hard, we can do it. The first win statement to experiencing the attitude of Jesus in a small group context is authenticity. To be authentic is to be real or genuine, not copied or false, true and accurate. I mean, let's be honest, how many of you have been in a context that was inauthentic? That's a big turnoff. Why? Because we know that it's not real. We know that it's, it's, it's just made up. And I think the truth is that authenticity reminds us of Jesus, doesn't it? That's why his disciples and followers loved him, because Jesus was the real deal. He spoke truth. He encouraged. He wasn't fake. He was honest. He wasn't bought out by special interest groups. He didn't make promises that he couldn't keep. Jesus was a true leader. He was the genuine article. And as a result, his followers refused to turn any other direction. And his small group was comprised of authentic faith. John 6, 66 through 69 says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. They had created authentic community so much so that these men were willing to die for their faith in Jesus because of what God had instilled in them. Think about that. They lived in such an authentic, sharing, God-centered community that they were willing to lay everything down for the truth they had experienced. This attitude of Jesus makes all the difference. The truth is people are not looking for other people that are perfect and have it all together. They want genuine people that are pursuing God and growing through their mistakes. Because here's the reality. If you live long enough, you realize that most people aren't upset with other believers because they're hypocrites, but because they're unwilling to be real and to admit when they've made mistakes and move and grow forward. And I love this statement that I heard years ago. It really challenges me. It says, I lead through my strengths, but I connect through my weaknesses. We have to be honest and transparent if we're going to have any deep level of Christ-honoring community. God calls you and I to lead in the way of authenticity. I remember the first time I went into a small group and really saw this. A friend of mine, David, and his wife, Amber, they led a small group for a long period of time. And I remember the first time I went, I went and everybody was just spilling the beans. They were saying all the stuff they had battled with and they wanted encouragement, they wanted prayer. And I kind of just stepped back and I was like, wow. I'm like, this is incredible. And they prayed for each other and they encouraged each other and they challenged each other towards faith. And I, I kind of stepped back and went, wow. I need to be more authentic in my relationships and more open and... And it brought to life in me that I can choose to be vulnerable. I can choose to be real. And I may be the only one that starts that. But we believe as a church culture and family that authenticity is contagious. 
that we're honest and real with each other, that we do life together. And yes, sometimes we may be burned, but it is worth it. And every time one of our small groups experiences authentic faith, whether through the leader or those that are being participating, it is a win for that small group context. The second win statement to experiencing the attitude of Jesus in a small group is growth. Small groups should be experiencing growth. And here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus did not do this the way we would have done it. For us, if we want to change the world, we're like, man, let's get a big rally. Let's fill out every stadium we can. We're going to pack it to the rafters. We're going to just preach the gospel. It's going to be amazing. And everyone's going to go out and change, and they're going to reach the world. Jesus goes, I'm going to take 12 disciple rejects. Huh? You're going to do what? I'm going to take 12 disciple rejects. One of them is going to betray me to death. And uh, I'm going to change the world with them. I'm going to spend three years of my life. I'm going to pour into them every day. I'm gonna teach them the truth of scripture. I'm gonna show them how to actually do it. We're gonna walk and do life together and we're gonna change the world. He did something that was completely countercultural and that concept is, is if you wanna change the world, he, he broke it down small. He said, if you really wanna make a difference, get it connected in small community where you grow and where you're challenged, where, you know what, if you wanna forgive, get around people. You wanna show love, get around people. You wanna show grace, get around people. You wanna show humility, get around people. And Jesus said, I don't wanna talk about faith, I wanna show you in relational context, I want you to do the journey together with me. There's two types of growth that we should see in small groups that are healthy. The first is spiritual and the second is numerical. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What's going on here is that Jesus is saying, listen, disciples make disciples. Don't just do all these big contexts. Disciples make disciples. So get in community, help people grow, invest your life, sharpen each other, and watch out. Because as you grow spiritually, it will be contagious and numbers will begin to fall. Lives will begin to be changed. People will begin to find interest and go, oh, you're different, why? Well, you know, God's been doing, oh, can I come to your small group? Yeah, I'd love that. And next thing you know, they're beginning to follow Jesus. You can have numerical growth without spiritual growth. It's, I mean, it's obvious. This year, go to a Warriors game. Katie's on the team now, it's gonna be packed out. Ticket prices are gonna go up, but look at it. You know what's gonna happen? Everybody's gonna be there, but that doesn't mean that people are growing spiritually. They're having a good time. But from a biblical perspective, when we choose to focus on growing our faith, ultimately we'll become contagious in a good way where we're gonna tell people about the good news of who Jesus is. They're gonna be attracted to the change that's happening in our life as we connect in community. The attitude of Jesus makes all the difference. We see this in the early church. It says in Acts 2 that they attended the temple together and they broke bread in their homes and they spent time together. And, and at the end of that verse, it says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It's not one or the other, it's both. And as we grow spiritually, we also begin to see numerical growth and change. And any time our small groups experience spiritual growth in a person's life and their faith in Jesus or coming to faith or a new person is added to that group that begins the journey, that is a win. The third win statement to experiencing the attitude of Jesus in a small group is simply relationship, personal and consistent relationship. One of my favorite stories of this is a young man named Jason who's actually an intern at our church right now. And Jason started off by going to a small group about a year ago. He started connecting with these other college young adult individuals who had faith in God. He didn't. He showed up as somebody who really didn't have a church context and he starts kind of hanging out and getting to know people and he sees how they treat each other and how they're honest and authentic and how they forgive and they're growing in their faith and he's like, man, there's something to this. Months kind of go by and eventually Jason commits his life to Jesus and he begins to follow Jesus and now he's a part of our internship team here at Calvary Temple Church that helps put on our weekend services and gatherings. And it's been incredible. When you ask him, he'll tell you that small group changed his life because they built a relationship with him. Regardless of where he came from, regardless of what he was at, they built a relationship. And here's the truth. Small groups are a delivery system for relationship, and relationships are often a very clear delivery system for the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Jesus understood the power of proximity. 
he knew that if he was around people long enough, they will catch what he had. Think about that. We live in a culture that has a million friends and followers, but very few real, genuine, life-changing relationships. And Jesus understood the power of this. That's why he did life with these disciples. It says in Mark 3, 14, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And one of my favorite verses of scripture, 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica and he says, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God. Okay, gospel, that's a pretty big thing, the gospel of God. Not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul understood the power of developing relationship and connecting in community. That's why we encourage our small groups that as they meet together, whether it's once a month, twice a month, every week, hey, don't just hang out at that time, do life. Go out to lunch with each other and, and break up into smaller groups and, and go do barbecues together and help each other with yard projects and, and be there for each other when someone's in the hospital or something's going wrong. Help each other, connect in community, do life together. Jesus gave us the gospel in the context of relationships because often we will be the only Jesus someone will ever tangibly see. So our relationship connection with others enables us the opportunity to build bridges that will ultimately connect them to God or help them to grow in their faith. The attitude of Jesus makes all the difference. The fourth win statement to experiencing the attitude of Jesus in small groups is affirmation. Affirmation. Affirmation is the process of building up or encouraging someone in who they really are in God or what they have done. Now, this is really important because we live in an affirmation-starved culture. And if I tell you, hey, give me 10 things you don't like about our government, you could If I say, give me 10 things you like, you'd be like, well, there's that, and uh, I think there's that. It would take us longer. Why? Our natural sinful state is to be negative. And God goes, listen, I don't want you to be like the rest of the world. I don't want you to be like the rest of culture. I want you to have eyes of faith, eyes of affirmation that believes and sees beyond what every person can see. Anybody can see the obvious. Because I want you to begin to see what's inside a person, what God has placed within them. Jesus shows this when his relationship with Peter, it says in Matthew 16, 13 through 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. A healthy small group, the leaders and those involved, learn how to see people not at just what they're at or where they're going through, but to see them for what God has placed in them and what could be. So they come in and they're struggling with an addiction. A person of faith, a person of affirmation goes, you know what? You're better than that addiction and I know that God's got a purpose for you and as I've been around you, I see your faith and I believe you have a gift for sharing your faith and I wanna encourage you, you can get beyond this and make a difference for God's kingdom. Somebody comes in and they, they're, they're, they're struggling and battling a relationship and someone in their small group says, you know what? No matter what happens in this relationship, I know that ultimately the relationship you have with God is gonna give you the strength to overcome. We believe in you. We'll be praying for you this week. Talk about a difference. Some of you, you're going through life and you're going, man, it's hard and I feel alone. Can I encourage you? Get connected in community and that will begin to change. Get around other people of like faith who believe in you, who want to help you. And I believe it will make an incredible difference in your journey. I know for me, when I began uh, to become a believer in Christ at the age of 16, there was a man, James Boyd, who was my spiritual dad. And from the moment I met him, he spoke life into me. He said, Jason, I, I know you say you feel called to be a pastor. I know you're gonna accomplish it. I know one day you're gonna be speaking to thousands of people. I know that one day, and he continued to speak that into my life until it became a reality. And to this day, he still speaks it into my life when I talk to him. He saw what sometimes I couldn't even believe for. When you get in Christ-centered community, that will begin to happen 
if it's healthy. Affirmation is also, though, reminding people of who they're called to be in the midst of difficulty. We see a few verses later that Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and why did he say that? Because Peter was saying, hey, you can't go to the cross, Jesus. And Peter, Jesus goes, listen, Peter, I'm gonna remind you, don't be a person like you used to be. Be a person of faith. So he rebukes him. Affirmation also says to people, hey, if I see you walking off the edge of a cliff, if I see you're in danger, because I love you and because I have a relationship with you and I have investment in you, I'm gonna tell you the truth. True friends care enough to confront. And let's be honest, we all receive correction better from people that have an investment in us than perfect strangers. And so as we do community and we're around people that love us, though we might not take it at first, eventually it will soak deep into us and we'll begin to change and walk in what God has for us. The attitude of Jesus in community makes all the difference. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. The fifth win statement to experiencing the attitude of Jesus in a small group context is that of serving, to serve. We see this with Jesus and his disciples in Mark 10, 43 through 45. It says, not so with you, Jesus said. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then we see Jesus use the beautiful example of washing his disciples' feet before he went to the cross to say, hey, this is how you're supposed to be treating each other. It's not about who's the strongest, who's the best, who's the brightest. It's about how can we do life together in a way that glorifies God and changes our culture. He says, serve. So anytime one of our small groups begins to serve the people in the group, that's a huge win for that small group. One of my favorite examples of this happened years ago with a couple in our church, Matt and Nor Forslund. At the time they were just engaged and Matt was kind of hanging out with his brother, his future brother-in-law and they were wrestling a little bit and he fell backwards and spiral fractured his fibia and tibia in his leg. He was rushed to the hospital over in Antioch, Kaiser. He's on his way over there. And in the midst of it, me and his fiance are communicating. I'm like, what's going on? How can we get there? We're like flying out there, okay? We're going as fast as we're, within speed limit. Uh, we're going out to Antioch. Uh, and as we get out there, by the time we get there, his small group was already there. They're like, yeah, we told him we're family in Christ. And we went back there and we prayed with them. And I saw this picture. And I thought, that is the body of Jesus. That is small church. That's the type of support and encouragement you and I receive when we choose to connect in small church community. The other thing we see is not just serving each other, but when we begin to serve the community, many of our small groups are engaged in things like Bay Area Rescue Mission or Habitat for Humanity or Clean Start through our churches. We help clean clothes for those less fortunate or Compassion Bags or Turkey Trot or Harvest to Home or you know, Christmas to the Community or Adopt a School. As we serve in the community as the hands and feet of Jesus, talk about how powerful that is, how it knits us together and grows us. I actually have this orange bag up here for a purpose. You're like, why is that up there? My small group every year, we put together bags for those who are homeless. And we, we all bring an item and we take time for one of our small group gatherings to put them together. And then throughout the year, we pass them out as we have opportunity. We put some Bibles in there, we encourage people, and then we talk about our experience. It's fun. It gives us an opportunity to tangibly serve and be the hands and feet of Jesus in the community. It's not fancy, it's simple, it's not complicated. But whenever our small groups are serving each other or the community, that is a huge win for us. The sixth win statement to experiencing the attitude of Jesus in a small group context is simply this, perseverance. Perseverance. One of my favorite stories is of Wayne and Judy Rufner. You may know them. They're an incredible couple in our church family. And they started a small group in Pinol almost a couple years ago now. And I remember when they first started, Judy's like, Jason, I don't know if anyone's gonna come to Pinole, but we, we feel like we're supposed to do this. And they started with a couple people in the group and a few months later, still a couple people. A few months later, still a couple people. Like, I don't know, Jason, we can do this. I, 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 nobody else is really coming. And next thing you know, a few more kind of started coming attending and then a few more and then a few more. And now they've got two amazing co-leaders helping them. They're leading and on average, they have over 20 people at their, week, their monthly small group meeting. And they're connecting in community. They're doing life together. They're celebrating. Now they're thinking, how can we launch this off so more people can be a part of it in Pinole? 
but they choose, chose to persevere in the midst of a time when they weren't so sure how it was gonna turn out. Perseverance is the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. And remember, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In Galatians 6, 9 through 10, it says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at a proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. How often have you and I been inches from the finish line without even realizing it? And God challenges us. Though it may not be easy, though sometimes it's difficult, every time you persevere in Christ-centered small church community, every time you choose to engage and connect, even when you'd like to disengage, that is a win for you and your group. And here's the truth. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. If you try some of our groups, you're like, ah, that one wasn't for me. No one's gonna be offended. Go and try another one. We got people that sign up for 10 groups and they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, there, there's the one. That's fine. But make sure you connect. Whether it was with friends that just get together impromptu, whether it would be a, a very intentional small group, the traditional, a serving group, just find a place where you can connect and grow. Remember the early church said, do not neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day draw near. You and I this weekend have a choice. Will we choose to see the world, to see small church like a lot of people do? Ah, I've tried it. I don't know, I've been hurt before. I've got some fears and some hesitancy. I, I don't know if I can be a part of this. Or will we take the route of Jesus and say, you know what? Though it's not perfect, it's an incredible way for me to grow. It's God's plan A. And I'm gonna get out of my comfort zone. I'm gonna connect in community and I'm gonna make it a priority in my life because I know ultimately it will help me to walk in the purpose that God has created me for. What would happen if all of us engaged in that way? First of all, nobody would be alone. People would be connected. When people were hurting, people would know. When someone was not here on a weekend, they would still have people that would connect with them during the week. When people were struggling and feeling alone and in crisis and a difficult moment, the loss of a loved one, they would have comfort. They would have people that would walk them through. People in our community would go, man, I notice a difference in you and these people you're hanging out with and you talk about these relationships. How can I have a part of that? And people would connect in relationship and grow. It's amazing what we can overcome when we are together because we are better together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all around the room?